The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for before and after the victory. Every week on reinforceua.com. Uh, hello, uh, everybody, uh, dear friends and colleagues in Ukraine and all over the world. I'm Vyacheslav Pokatilo, and on behalf of the MIM Kiev Business School, welcome you on Reinforce UA project. Uh, this project was designed and already several months is, is going on uh, by initiative of MIM Kiev with the support of uh, Bogdan Havrilishin Family Foundation, uh, 50 Thinkers Organization, and three major uh, business education uh, associations, AACSB, uh, FMD, and AMBA. Um, we are very grateful for all donations, um, um, everybody who made uh, and registered to this project, and remind you that all money will be directed to support uh, temporarily displaced Ukrainian women uh, who would like to start their own businesses. Uh, the project, this lecture today will be recorded and will be available further on, on our site or on YouTube as well. Uh, but at the end of uh, today's presentation, uh, we have a possibility to ask questions. Uh, and for this purpose, I kindly ask you to use Q&A button uh, rather than chat. And now I have a privilege to introduce you uh, Subir uh, Chodhuri. Uh, Dr. Subir Chodhuri uh, is called by Evan Business Week magazine as a quality prophet. The subject quality is widely known for all businessmen and is widely used, but we still again and again return to this, um, uh, to this question. And uh, Mr. Chodhuri is a famous, uh, uh, famous thinker in this respect and uh, a consultant and wrote 15 books. And his last, last book, uh, the difference um, um, is uh, uh, on the is on the bestseller. Uh, so welcome, um, uh, Mr. Chudhuri. Uh, we, we are very we appreciate your time and your agreement to join a Reinforce UA project in this time. And before I will give you the floor, I would just make uh, one short announcement to every participants who will have now. We have, as you know, uh, I, I address to those who are in Ukraine. We have a currently a blackouts uh, uh, all, all the whole history and currently we, we run this uh, this seminar today webinar today from several uh, some several sites uh, i may disappear because of the bless code but my colleagues in canada will will, will pick up um, uh, the responsibility and will follow on so for everybody who won't be uh, who won't uh, uh, who won't be touched by by these blackouts? Uh, please uh, stay with us, uh, and we'll continue. And now it's time, and uh, my great honor uh, to give the floor floor to uh, uh, Subir Chodhuri. Welcome again, and the floor is yours. Thank you. So thank you so much. Hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, it's a great honor uh, to be uh, participate in this particular uh, seminar, especially uh, the challenging time uh, our friends at Ukraine are going through. Um, I'm deeply honored and humble uh, that I can contribute something in this toughest time. Um, and our thoughts and prayers are with you, the people of Ukraine. And obviously my own nation, America, has been a tremendous supporter uh, of your mission. So um, today, why, what I'd like to discuss about that, how uh, quality impact um, by, the, you know, by the people. So when I define quality, and I'm sure uh, most of you may know about my work because my work has been translated more than 25 languages. Um, and I have uh, 15 books uh, that uh, a lot of them are bestseller around the world. Um, several, several of them is also translated in different um, language in Europe as well, uh, mostly published by Financial Times of London. Um, and so when I talk about quality, quality is all about uh, the combination of people power and the process power. 
So what I've done in my uh, career for the last 25 years, uh, I've been literally helping different types of organization, mostly Fortune 500 organizations, but as well as some tiny little hospital or uh, tiny little companies, as well as I help, um, especially my methodology has been widely used in a small organization, mid-sized organization, as well as the large corporation. Uh, so one of the things what I find is that you know, anytime if you really wanted to improve uh, quality, obviously your process has to be the best in class, right? So the so our, my expertise, my last 25 years of my career, I literally work on um, how to improve the processes, how to uh, fix the processes so that, you know, and, and, and on the, by doing that, because always remember if there's a work, there is a process, uh, you know, if there's a work, there is a process, and if there's a process, there's a variation. So variation is the reason there is a lot of uh, challenges happen. Um, there's a lots of uh, problems happen, and variation is the reason that company lose tremendous amount of uh, money. So um, my job is to, when the companies hire me as a consultant, they try to help them to fix their processes. So I literally save um, some tiny little company to a quarter million dollar to a a company to almost a $10 billion, right? <laughs> Literally $10 billion. I helped some of the Fortune 500 companies. So um, to, today's, you know, when I'm discussing about that, when I talk about the quality equal to process power and the people power. So when on the, you know, the process power side, as you may know, some of you may know heard of the uh, word, something called Six Sigma or design for Six Sigma, which is a stand for uh, DFSS or TQM, which is a total quality management. So traditionally organizations are always focusing on improving the processes by using these quality tools. And as I say, some of my clients receive 10X versus 200X return, you know, lots of different clients. Now, one of the things what I find out is that why, you know, suppose there is the same size of two companies. So in America, for an example, just for the sake of discussion in America, we have a two automotive companies called GM and Ford. They are kind of the same size um, and similar employee base, similar revenue based uh, companies. Now, suppose both of them, suppose both of them hired me as a consultant to help them uh, improve their processes. Now, I used either Six Sigma or Design for Six Sigma or TQM, different types of uh, processes. I used them on both clients, similar process I used. Now, one company is getting 10 times return of investment. So that means suppose if they spend um, $10 million of consulting fee, uh, they might get you know, $100 million return. But another company, which only has spent $10 million with consulting fee, but they are getting $2 billion worth of return. So initially I was thinking, maybe my process is flawed. Why we are using the same companies using the same process, similar size of companies, two different companies. Why one is getting 10 times return, another one is getting 200 times return. So I got really puzzled by that. So then I did a tremendous amount of a study for almost for five years in all types of companies to figure it out. Is it the, really the process or is it the people? And the answer came to, at the end of the day, it is the people who does the process. So the companies which are literally uh, getting the processes right, they are the one who uh, can uh, get the best results. So that means the companies which is have the people who is using the processes um, correctly, they can get the best results, you know? Um, so that's what, that's what we try to, uh, I'm going to talk about today. Um, so one of the things is that as you can see in my, you know, the my subtitle of my topic today is that good is not good enough. In fact, you know, that is the same subtitle like of my book, the difference is um, when good enough is not enough, that is the title. So if you really think about it in two, just, I'm just giving you the US data, I'm sure Ukraine or Europe, different countries have the similar type of data. So one of the, you know, in 2021, a Gallup poll, revealed that Americans reported get great deal of confidence in these different areas. So think about it. Only 51% of Americans, they have confidence in police. 
44% in medical system, 33% in banks, 32% in the public school system, 29% in the technology companies, 16% in television news, and 12% of the politician for the US Congress. So that means, you know, if I define quality is the, you know, 100%, then think about it, how much we have to go, how much behind America is in each of these segments. And I, I took the cross-functional data from all different industries. So you cannot just say, so this is, you know, if you think about the finance or to the school or, or to the journalist or to the politician or to the technology companies or to the, you know, the people who are supposed to save us, the police, everywhere, or the medical system, everywhere we have the issues. So that means we have a long way to go. And it's not just in America, even if I go to China, if I, if I go to Europe, if I go to um, India, everywhere, it, maybe the numbers will change a little bit, but we have a long way to go. So honestly speaking, even I'm in the field of quality, I think, you know, unfortunately, the quality profession, we, we have a long way to fix the world in, you know, in a lot of the challenges. So, so I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, about this, you know, what do you, uh, I, this title is called the what do, you, what do you do with a toothpick when you are done with it? So uh, let me tell you this story. I was in an organization um, and um, I was meeting with the, one of the senior leadership uh, is a Fortune 500 company. Um, their vice president of quality, as soon as I walked in, in his room, um, he closed the door and he said, should we write a question for you? What do you do with a toothpick when you are done with it? And I was very puzzled when he told me that. What kind of question is that? So I asked him, what kind of, he said, no, no, you need to tell me, what do you do with it? I said, yeah, if I'm done with the toothpick, I just put it in a dustbin. That's what I do. He said, are you sure? I said, why you say that? He said, Shibir, you know, today morning before I, you know, I, I was meeting with him around at 8 a.m. in the morning and he had a meeting at 6 a.m. with his boss, with the CEO. And he said, after the meeting is done around the 6.45 when I'm coming out, of the CEO's office, I found a toothpick on the floor um, of my CEO's office, outside of my CEO's office. So that means somebody used a toothpick and literally throw it on the floor. Now, that is a major problem in the company because irrespective of how much quality we put, how much of quality and uh, processes we put in our company, if the people does not have the mindset of quality, mindset of quality, then we may not able to fix the organization. So, um, you know, so, and, and that is very, very critical point. So if a quality and performance are the reflection of every employee, regardless of their position. So if the successful company from top to bottom can have a caring mindset, then we may able to achieve the highest number of quality. Then the previous slide, when you talked about, you know, uh, medical only 44% uh, American trust the medical system, they may, you know, that might improve, you know, or the police system only 51%, you know, we trust the police system. So it will, so if the all employee from the, so quality is not just only senior leaders business or the middle managers business or the, or the floor level, you know, assembly line workers business or, or the person who's a janitor's business. It is everyone's business. Every single person from the bottom to the top has to have the caring mindset. So then the question comes to what is caring mindset? How can we develop caring mindset? So every one of your profession today, you know, 100 or 200 people around the world who is attending this um, webinar, each of you work in a either in a non-profit or for-profit, maybe somebody is a CEO, somebody is a professor, or somebody is a student, or somebody is a you know low-level employees, or somebody is a middle-level employee. It doesn't matter what your profession is. Every one of you, as a human being, can develop caring mindset. So I've done a huge study with a lot of different companies, uh, global companies, to find out how what is the caring mindset. Um, so I'd like to discuss that as an individual, that after the presentation, you will have a pretty good idea how each of you can develop a caring mindset. So what is caring mindset? I was tremendously 
influenced by a, um, um, a Stanford University professor. Um, her, uh, she has an international bestseller, best-selling book called Mindset. Um, she's a psychologist and brilliant psychologist. She wrote a book called The Mindset. And over there, she, Carol Dweck, she talked about, um, you can change your mindset. So any one of you at any position can change your mindset. So to do the mindset based on my research, what I found, this is my finding, what I found, there's a four attributes you can develop, you have to develop. It's called, it stands for a star, S-T-A-R. So it stands for straightforward, thoughtful, accountable, and resolved. Um, so those are the four attributes is very critical to develop. So in fact, in my book, uh, the difference uh, that, uh, this is the book, the, the difference that I authored, which is kind of available in um, Europe as well in different languages. Uh, over there in this book, I talked about this star principle that what I'm I'll be discussing today. So how can you develop this four principle? That means that if you can become straightforward, and be thoughtful and be accountable and have resolve, you can develop caring mindset. So I'm going to talk about each of these attributes now um, with different examples. So let's talk about the being straightforward. Now, Randy Posh, he's a professor. He was a professor at Carnegie Mellon. At the age of um, 53 or 54, he diagnosed with, uh, with um, cancer and he gave a last lecture um, before he passed away. Um, and he talked about, and that last lecture to his students became world famous lecture. And then ultimately it came out with the book called The Last, last Lecture, and it became an international bestseller, um, translated several languages around the world, it's available. And he talked about, it is interesting, the secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life. The secrets you decide to reveal at the end of your life. That is a profound, uh, finding he, he talked about. So most of us may not practice being straightforward. We may fake a lot of the time. So let's talk about what is the straightforward. So I'm going to tell you a real life story. And, and just so that you know, because of my consulting background, I have worked with all different types of organization, but every single story I share is 100% true story, but I changed the name of the person um, and I did not tell about the client's name uh, because of the confidentiality reason, uh, but it is kind of universal uh, story. So this particular executive is a Fortune 500 senior executive, which I call him, I name him Nick. Um, now, uh, one day um, that, and I know Nick for almost for uh, 15 years. Um, and when he was a kind of a middle manager position, I knew him at that time. And 15 years later, he became the you know, number two position holder in the company. And when he was in the number two position of the company, he was around 52, 53 years old. He suddenly called me one day and he said, Shabir, can you drop everything and come to my office immediately? And I said, hey, relax. What, what do you mean by that? I, I mean, you know, I have different plan or whatever. He said, no, cancel everything. I need help. Can you come right now? I said, is that emergency? He said, it's very emergency. I need your help. I said, okay. So I immediately called my assistant and, and literally canceled all my meetings and immediately drove. And it took me almost an hour to go to my office, to his office, happened to be on the same you know, city we live. And as soon as I walked into his office, he never closed the door. This time, as soon as I entered his office, he closed the door, locked the door. And then as soon as I sit here, sit in my chair, he looked at me and he said, Shibir, I wanted to talk with you something. Only my wife and my boss know, nobody else in the world knows. So I said, okay. He said, I need your help on something because you have been trying to tell me something I never listened to you for last 15 years. And I wanted you to kind of teach me something else. I said, okay. He said, can you teach me how to earn forgiveness? I was really puzzled by that. I said, hey, what kind of question is that? You want me to teach you how to earn forgiveness? What do you mean by that? Why you want to earn forgiveness? From who? He said, Shibir, I have only 15 days to live. 
only 15 days. Doctor said, I have a stage four cancer. The, it completely has spread out um, my whole body. And I, they gave me only 15 days. I'll be gone by within 15 days. So now you know why I got this position. I got this position because anybody come to my way, I fired them, I demoted them. I got this position. And you always told me to be kind with the people, kind with these executives, but I never did. And a lot of them left the company and everything else. So I now have only 15 days. These 15 days, what should I do to all the people? I felt I did something bad to them because I don't want to die with any regret. So all these people used to work for me last 20 years. What should I do with them? So I just told him, I said, look, first of all, I was very puzzled. You know, I was very shocking mode. I, I was almost in my tears and um, tried to calm him down. And he said, no, it, you cannot change that. So long as to short, what this gentleman did, he literally reached out um, to as many people used to work for him and reached out to them and sincerely asked them their forgiveness. And ultimately he lasted, he lived for six months instead of 15 days. So, but those six months, he went out and literally tried his level best to, um, to kind of earn the uh, forgiveness from each of the people who used to report to him. And so the real question would be, is that if Nick's life, I really wonder if he practiced most of his work life with the same mindset, what he did for the last six months of his life, he might've been contributed much more. So the real question is that every single day when we wake up, we have a choice to make. How can we become honest to each other? And especially with the social media and everything else is going on, that there is so much of, um, you know, a fakeness I see. So unless you develop the straightforward type of mindset, it's very difficult um, to lead a life, you know, so good life. So um, I wanted to give you another example. When Alan Mulali um, came to Ford Motor Company, um, at that time, um, he uh, was hired from Boeing because to turn around Ford. Um, and then when he came in, he um, asked all of his senior leadership team to tell them, um, you know, the, if they have the major challenges, those challenges are red. And if there is some of them are, can be, you know, they cannot solve, those are red, but the one they can solve, that might be yellow if the company can help them and they don't have any problem, then it's green. So can you tell each of you, tell me what is red, green, if you have any red projects right now. And these are direct report to the CEO of Ford. And he just came to the organization. And amazingly, what happened, every single person, every single person on that day who directly report to Ford CEO said everything they have is green because they're afraid to tell the truth to the CEO. And he was stunned by that, that how can it be all green? If it is all green, why Ford is suffering and they fired another CEO and hired Alan to um, run this organization. And so he told them, hey, look, first of all, if you um, tell me the truth, even if it's a nasty, then nasty truth, but tell me the truth, then there is no punishment. I came here to help you. So you should not be afraid of me. So a lot of the time in the organization, we bury all kinds of failures, all kinds of problems under the rug. Like that means we hide the information because we um, are afraid of somebody, right? That what is the punishment for doing that? And so to make that, as soon as he gave that comfort to the senior leadership team, one executive raised the hand and said, I have lots of red. If you're not going to punish me, let me tell you my red. And then he told me as soon as he opened up, a lot of the other executives say all those reds. So then what happened? Alan got, Alan gave everybody high five to telling them the truth, telling them the, you know, the all the reds, saying that, okay, now we can work together to figure it out. How can we turn those red into green? 
So that means that honesty is the foundation of any organizational success. But unfortunately, nowadays we fi don't find that in, at least in my experience, in a lot of companies working that we don't find that type of authenticity and, and honesty. So cost of the dishonesty. So I'm giving to give you some data uh, of cost of dishonesty, just in American data, you know, because whole world benchmark America saying that, you know, so much of greatest stuff is going on in America. That's why I'm giving you an American data. Look at it, Cornell University did a, a study on the white collar crime. White collar means executive level. White collar crime cost America a, over $300 billion annually. $300 billion annually by the white collar crimes. And most of the white collars are top university MBAs, top university graduates. Top 20 university graduates of the, you know, a lot of them are. Look at it. It's costing them $300 billion. The fraud in the property and casualty industry, approximate $24 billion. What dropping cost is costing retailers $16 billion. IRS estimates they taxpayers <laughs> pay versus what they should pay, approximate $353 billion per year. This is the cost of dishonesty. I just gave you some three different, like four different industries, kind of a snapshot. Think about that. So that means as a human being, how dishonest and how much we can go further. So the factor, literally what my study found is that the factors that hinder the straightforwardness is two things. Number one is the fear and number two is the greed. And both of them, you can, you know, each of you don't need to learn about those two things. But the point is, when you are afraid, the openness and trans transparency decrease exponentially. And when you are authentic and candid and straightforward, we enjoy our works more. So it is the leader's job. It is the leader's job, the number one person in the organization's job, how to create a fearless culture, how to how a leader cannot lead a greed you know, type of life or fear type of, uh, you know, create a fearless type of environment. That was the critical for being the straight forwardness. So then the real question I want you to ask yourself, um, two questions, yourself, you as an individual, irrespective of your position, what do you lose when you or the people around you the seek to easy way out. And are you being a straightforward now in any dealing you do? So you as a manager, you know, or whatever level you're working on, always asking that question, are you really dealing with a straightforward way? And, um, you know, what do you literally lose out when people around you are seeking the easy way out? You know, ask those type of questions continuously. If you ask these two questions, you will um, kind of practice and improve your estate forwardness. So the next point is about the being thoughtful. So I shared a fantastic quote by Gautam Buddha. Buddha talked about if a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, pure thought, happiness follows him. So that means, you know, and very blunt with you, you know, I. I was appalled by the, um, uh, you know, the tenacity and uh, the sacrifice the currently Ukrainian peoples are making. And I'm uh, very touched by that and uh, tremendously uh, grateful to all the things you, all of you are doing for your nation um, and, and protect your own land. And I'm very uh, grateful. And that is one of the reasons that I'm very humble to, um, you know, you invited me for this presentation, even in this tough time. So obviously our thoughts and prayers are with all of you who are currently in Ukraine and all the people outside of Ukraine who are literally uh, supporting and, and suffering for their family members or the loved ones. So regarding the being the thoughtful one, and I know during the tough time to talk about thoughtfulness to you, it is very tough. So. I, I sincerely apologize for that, but I still 
wanted to, you know, this is one of the critical element of developing the uh, caring mindset. So let me talk about that, how to develop the thoughtfulness. So I wanted to give you an, a story about, um, again, it's another true story about a power of a glass of water. Uh, typically in America, um, there is a, uh, when you board a flight uh, in local flight, which is between, you know, domestic flight in, in United States, uh, traditionally, if you are in the business class uh, seats, you normally offer drink before the flight takes off, traditionally. Um, most of the airlines do that, you know, in the first class, they call it first class or business class, they offer drinks. Um, so uh, one day I was flying from one, you know, from Los Angeles to Detroit, and uh, one of the uh, very old man around maybe, you know, I should say 75, 80 years old man uh, was kind of breathing very hard. Um, he um, at a, boarded the plane and sat, sat on the economy class on the, you know, which is kind of behind the first class. And uh, he asked for a glass of water to the flight attendant and flight attendant refused um, saying that he is not in first class and he cannot uh, give the glass of uh, water. She cannot give the glass of water. And uh, one young man who was sitting on the uh, first class, uh, kind of one row in front of me, he saw that, you know, after the, he was like the old man was rejected three times for a glass of water. So young man went in, you know, on there and then poured a glass of water and then served him. And whole first class, everybody kind of clapped it. And whole flight, we are discussing about how awful the service is and, and everything else. Now, the real question would be, I kind of paused myself in that moment and I felt that shame on me, why I did not take that action what the young man did. So I positioned myself saying that why I did not take that. So the point is that when seeing the others need in help, we should not be passive and wait for someone help to help. You acted immediately. That is one of the reasons that I'm very grateful to the people of Ukraine, the men and women who are fighting you know, this and did not leave their country and trying to uh, fight uh, for their nation, you know, uh, to save their nation. And uh, this part really is very important because nowadays in America, we are at least in America and around the world, I literally see the empathy part is missing. You know, and when we are empathetic for others, we are practicing what it means to be thoughtful. Anything you see, anything you see in your in your workplace that you always try your best to be empathetic to others. Like one thing I really admire my own country in United States that who kind of are tremendously empathetic, especially this whole Ukraine challenge and trying to support even in the government level, lots of the community people are raising money for Ukraine. Um, in America, that's what I see in Los Angeles or New York because I travel extensively. And that kind of touched my heart that at least even though we, a lot of these Americans never visited Ukraine, it's still they feel what is happening is not right. We wanted to give a hand, you know. So I think in your organization, whatever you do, try to be empathetic and thoughtful to another human being. And if you have that, trust me, your organization will succeed. If I can convert the lowest of the lowest employee to the best of the best employee, having that empathetic mindset, you will see that your organization will succeed, irrespective of whatever it is. But unfortunately, in the universities, in the organization, I don't hear that. I don't see this type of um, discussion. So I'm really pushing myself, a lot of the leaders to you know, practice this. Right now in America, right now, even one party, like there's two political parties, Democrat and Republican, they hate each other. There's no empathy. And America is suffering for that as a country, as a nation. So, you know, we may not agree to each other, but we have to respect each other. We have to be thoughtful to each other. That is the foundation of this particular bullet. So, you know, and I talk about the listen to internal customer and external customer. Each of you have an internal customer, each of you have an external customer. Let me explain to you what is the external customer. External customer is, is the people, like the customer who buy your product or buy your service.
but who is the internal customer? Internal customer is your children. Is, is internal customer is your spouse, you know, husband or wife, or your loved ones. You know, your parents can be internal customers, or your um, colleagues can be internal customers. But one philosophy I always believe: if you don't take care of the internal customers, you may never take care of the external customers. So that means always remember when. If you are not having a good time, you cannot serve to the external customers. So it is very important that genuine listening is very important. So listening part is extremely critical. Um, so a lot of the time we hear, but we don't listen. So genuine listening requires you pay the attention to the meaning behind the words and observe them. So I read a book called The Sound Business by Julian Treasure, and he talked about that how you, um, you know, unconscious filters that inhibit our, our ability to listen. What are the reasons that we may not be able to listen properly? It's because the cultural barriers, personality, expectation, beliefs, values, intentions, language. So even though I'm speaking right now as an American consultant or a global consultant, today, this is speech to all of you. If most of you are in Ukraine or, or on those nations, I guarantee you 50% or 40% of my speech, you it may not resonate with you because of the cultural barriers or because of the, uh, or uh, some of the experience I may not have what you have in your culture. And so a lot of the time the things is lost. Irrespective of how much research you do, it still is very important your own values, your own personality, your own organization. So when with your organization is you have to, one organization is different than the another organization. So always remember the listening part, unless you have the genuine listening, listen part, you may not be able to be thoughtful to others. So you try your level best to develop the listening skill. Don't give your opinion immediately. If you, if you disagree, try to listen to the other. See that whole, you know, this, even this conflict, because, you know, uh, I don't want to go to the politics, but even these two nations, doesn't matter what nation, even either is in America versus China or North Korea and South Korea or Russia or Ukraine, the major issue is the listening. We are not listening to each other, even though we are human beings, right? So how you develop that? And a lot of our, and a lot of the time when you are in power, we, we continuously, our listening power decrease and decrease and decrease, even though we'll give you, give the politically right thing to say, but we don't practice what we say. So that is one of the reason I think is important irrespective of your position to develop a genuine listening skill so that you can become thoughtful to more thoughtful to others. My next, you know, the within the thoughtful also you, I talk about the empathy is the very important and empathy is all about to value another person as a human being who provides what to the community, to our society, to our country, and to everyone else. So that, you know, I feel why as a, you know, why I felt today that I need to spend some time. If even one person get the value from uh, this uh, speech, yes, I, I feel that I, I uh, achieve something. So that is very critical that, um, that you know, you, you have to, um, kind of show the empathy, not only just to another person, but within your community, even if somebody you don't know, if you are, they're in trouble, then try to give a hand. There's nothing wrong with it. And very honest with you, I think we Americans should learn some of the empathy what in the war zone Ukrainians are showing. We wanted to learn from you because some of you are showing already that how you are helping other people. And that is an amazing, um, amazing, amazing, uh, learning, like even we are in tears some of the time what is seen television that how you are helping to another person who you don't even know. But unfortunately, social media made us very individualistic. It is all about me, 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 me. It is not about you, 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 you. What I'm trying to do is that instead of a me, 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 me become selfish, we need to be much more empathized for others. Try to concentrate, focus into me to transform the me need to use your needs. That's what is the most important. So on this thoughtfulness, 
the question you need to ask all the time, is there anyone in your life today who needs a glass of water right now? Anyone. And if you can reach out and serve that glass of water, I gave you that analogy about the glass of water. The next point is about accountability. Uh, one of the things, you know, even in Ukraine war, I love about that, that a lot of the young men or women, they've decided they wanted to stay, they wanted to help, they wanted to die for the country. And some of them um, might have been easily left. In fact, some of them I found fascinating, like they are the benchmark of Mother Teresa's discord. Do not wait for leaders, do it alone. I remember some of the Ukrainian the, uh, athletes, they did not leave. They fought for the country and gave their life. Think about it, true leader. They felt their nation need them. They felt I'm accountable for it. So, you know, Mother Teresa, not a Indian born woman, but she's more than an Indian. She adopted the Indian sari, you know, the look and everything and saw millions and millions, not only Indian around the world, so many millions of people either of all faith, she saved lives. So that's why she said, don't wait for leaders. Do it alone. If you truly believe in something, you make yourself accountable. And if you feel that way, one day you will achieve something big. So even in organization, it also either for an organization. So let me give you a prime example. A 13 year old girl uh, in 2013, um, her name is Trisha Prabhu. And think about it. She's the only 13 year old girl from Illinois. She was horrified. A 11 year old Florida girl committed suicide due to the cyber bullying. Cyber bullying, right? So she came to her home and she refused in front of her parents saying that, hey, forget about everything else. I wanted to take that problem I need to solve myself. So what she did, she had been doing a lot of research on her own. She said, hey, do you know what? Parents and adults are continuously talking about it. Cyberbullying is reducing, but no, it is continuously continuing and nobody's doing anything about it. So, you know, shame on all the adults. I'm going to solve this problem. So do you know what she did? 13 year old girl, she came up, she did a research and she found out 90%, 90% statistically they showed of the children when they are trying to do or write a hate mail or hate, uh, you know, type something, you know, bullying somebody. If you pose them a question, if you interrupt them before they type it, if the question says, are you sure you wanted to send this uh, because it's going to hurt somebody's feeling? Are you sure you wanted to send that? 90% of the people, because of that one question, they stop not sending it. So what she did, she came up with an app. She came up with an app. That app asked that question. So as soon as somebody, uh, and, and now that app is, um, is adopted by Facebook, Google, everybody adopted that app. So anybody's writing some hate crime type of, a, like a hate related stuff and sending it, immediately it will pop up and say, are you sure you want to do it? Guess what? 90% say they are not going to do it. They didn't do it. Because of that, now there's a lot of cyber bullying stuff decreased, a lot of the suicide decreased because of these girls that app they installed. Whoever installed that app, that helped. So the point on this is that accountability can be anybody. If you, when you inspire others, you know what it means to feel accountable. So think about it. Today, one of the world's top management thinker is talking in an international stage a 13 year old leadership, 13 year old leadership. So if a 13 year old can do it, why not you? So each of you can be, can make it accountable. Accountability is your own business. So if you wanted to do it, just do it. If you believe in something, just do it. So five factors that being accountable for the five things, basically being aware that something needs to be done taking personal responsibility for it. The problem, what I find, a lot of the time, anytime there's a problem happen, we literally point finger at others. We never point finger to us. What I'm going to respectfully request to you, you just, anything you see problem in the world, you take the personal responsibility for it. 
and rise for it and believe in it and go for it. Once you make that personal responsibility, you will achieve it. Making a choice or decision to act. If you, you know, if you take a personal responsibility, then you'll make a choice and you make a decision to act on it. If you don't take an act on it, there is no problem. You know, a lot of the time project fail because there's no accountability. Then think, li think deeply about the potential consequences and setting a very high expectation. If you have these five attributes, then you will feel being yourself accountable. So ask this question, in what part of your life is it most important for you to take accountability right now? And work on that, work on that area, okay? It can be anything, it can be your family matter, it can be your uh, personal matter, it can be your office matter, it can, doesn't matter, whatever it is, try to make that accountability. So um, the next point is about the resolve. You know, obviously, <laughs> The people of Ukraine has a tremendous amount of resolve, as, as I can see, you know, because of the war, you know, you wanted to win and you wanted to um, uh, make sure uh, that without the resolve, there's no way you could have been achieved what you achieved until today. So Benjamin Franklin talked about the resolve to perform what you ought to perform without fail, what you resolve. That is an excellent quote about the resolve. So McKinsey uh, and company did a study um, on the lack of resolve in the company projects. What they found with, you know, with the University of Oxford, they did a study on the 5,400 large IT project. And what they found that 40% of the project only met in schedule and budget and quality goals. 45% of them ran over budget, 7% ran over schedule committed to, 56% of them uh, that was predicted um, the value that's supposed to be delivered. So think about that way, you know, and a study of the government projects in the United, United Kingdom in UK by Guardian newspaper found $4 billion in wasted efforts as a result of the failed project. So think about it, you know, irrespective of what company you work on, you are always working on some project. It doesn't matter if it's an IT project or any project. The question is that because don't start a project unless you know you are going to resolve that project. So problem is, Majority of the time, we as a human start a project and we don't have any resolve, then we wash the hand. So make sure you don't start a project because otherwise it's a waste to your organization. So you have to take a personal accountability for it and make sure that don't waste project. Like look at it, any of the failed project, it costs the organization. Even a country like UK losing $4 billion for the government project, they are losing because of the failed project. So don't start a project without resolve. That is the main point on this slide. So I wanted to give you a kind of a example of um, you know, what is the foundation of the resolve. And this is a personal example. Um, never, never, never give up. That is the one thing. And obviously, you know, again, I come back to your own country as a Ukraine that yes, you guys are not giving up. Think about the determination and the find a solution, no matter how long it takes. So, you know, every time when I wrote a book, and as you know, I wrote 15 books, and every time I wrote, write a book, it is a, it is a challenge. And, uh, you know, every book has its own challenge. So let me tell you, you know, when I wrote my first book on management in 1991, um, I felt tremendous amount of challenge because what happened was, uh, and, and you have to think about this way, I was only 27 year old writing the first management book of my life and I was getting rejection after rejection. Guess what? 21 rejections in America happened. Still, I didn't give up. Do you know what I did? I said, maybe American editors doesn't understand what I'm coming from. Maybe the idea is so big, these guys don't get it. So guess what I did? Then I left US, went to UK publisher, and I start from the top. So I went to UK, number one publisher, Financial Times. I went to them, they read it, same manuscript, same thing. They said, oh my God, this is stunning. This will become one of the top book of the world. So think about that. So Financial Times, pop, America, 21 publisher rejected. And still I didn't give up. Went to UK, UK Financial Times picked it up. The book published, 
the book became the European business book of the year. It's called the Management 21C, translated more than 15 or 20 languages. Then the people who rejected in America, 21 publishers, they paid even triple money to get the right for American rights to buy the right for the book. So what that story tells you, if you believe in something, if you have the resolve, never give up until your last breath. Tremendous amount of determination. I can tell you a story after a story for every one of my book. And I wanted to kind of give you my own personal story so that you understand that it didn't happen. Can you imagine that? I told at that time, even after 20 fast rejection, I still told my wife, this book will become one of the best book in the, in the world. And it, it did. And that changed my life. Instantly, after the book came out, um, you know, I was invited by all the world's top business schools to come in, to give a lecture about the book and all this stuff. And then by the age I was, you know, I think the book came out when I was 29. By the age 30, I became one of the top management thinker. Think about it. I could have been easily failed saying that, okay, it's not a good book. You know, I give up, never give up. That is the secret of having the result, never give up. The other thing is that willing to change. Every day is an opportunity to learn. When every single day, think about it, you know, the, you introduced me initially that I'm one of the world's top management thinker or whatever, but every single day when I wake up, when I'm brushing my teeth, I look at myself in the mirror, I think I don't know anything. What can I learn something? Ask yourself, what, what is something, no matter how small that I can do, has the potential to make a big, huge impact. Ask that question every single day. There'll be challenges along the way, but that is not the sign to stop. You continue to keep it going. Every single day, I feel that what can I learn something new today? What can I learn? What is the one thing I can learn? Always I feel that I don't know enough. And so I can see my 15 year old son, he's, as soon as he tweet, he has a more follower on the tweet than I have. So what can I learn from his techniques? Even though I'm the world's top management thinker, so that means I feel that I don't know. I have to learn from the child. Why not? Learning is such a thing. Everything I feel any day, every day I feel when I wake up saying that I don't know anything. What can I learn something? That excites me. So I learned from fiction book. The other thing I wanted to tell you, I don't know how many of you in the audience are from business. Obviously, it is that, you know, from majority of you might be from the business, but always try to read at least one or two fiction book or one or two poetry book per year. It will give you different feeling. It will make you more human. That will help you a better manager. That is the quality of life is all about. So ask this question, you know, when you have the result, do you ever settle for less than your best? And are you determined to excel at whatever you put your mind into? If you have these two questions, you mark my word, you'll be tremendously successful, whatever you do. So to wrap it up, this is the star. So S stands for straightforward, which is be honest, be direct, fair, candid with those you interact with. T stands for thoughtful, listen, empathize with others, be attentive, act with consideration and avoid selfishness. A for accountable, be aware of circumstances in which something needs to be done and take the personal responsibility to do it. If it is your, not your responsibility, you will not be accountable. Always think yourself, not to the others. Don't blame others. Always think yourself, then you can make a difference to the world. And having the result, act consistently to support whatever you are passionate about and go about it. So if you can have this, and I call this as a people power. So unless the organization which is getting the 200 times return, majority of the people have that star mindset. So if you can develop from a bottom of the organization to the top of the organization, majority of the employees can have the more attributes of a straightforward, thoughtful, accountable resolve, you will see your organization will be transforming. So I wanted to uh, share a story about, you know, always remember, irrespective of your position, always remember you, yourself, Irrespective of your position, you can be a janitor or you can be a CEO. You can make a difference. You can make a difference. And let me tell you, 
when I was a child, uh, I was born in Bangladesh. Uh, at that time, it was one of the most poorest country. And I was born in 1967. So uh, we got independence in 1971. So 72, 73 time frame, my age is around five or six. My grandfather is a, uh, was a, uh, a school teacher, elementary school teacher. So he used to give me, I was four or five years old, he used to give me a pen and a coin. And he used to say, pick one of the two. So every time I pick a coin, because I wanted to buy some chocolate or this and that, he used to tell me, no, 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 never, never pick a coin. Always pick the pen. So I said, why grandfather? And, and my grandpa used to say, hey, coin, once you use the coin, it will be gone. Either you buy a chocolate or whatever, after 10 minutes, or after one hour, 10 minutes, one day, it will be gone. But if you choose a pen, there will be so much coin you will come. You don't, you'll not know where to keep those coins. So, uh, so that he also told me that anything you see, anything you see in the world, even if you see a building or if you see a book or if you, whatever you see, everything is created by a pen. Even if somebody destroyed something, you can rebuild it. It is created by a pen. So always remember and respect this pen. So then he told me also anything that creation by the pen, if you agree or disagree, you reach out to them. So for an example, if you read a book, if, the, if you like the book or dislike a book, if you write to the author. So I started writing and I said, Grandpa, you know, I'm only seven year old or eight year old. If I write a letter to an eminent author, they may not reply to me. So my grandfather used to say, if they don't reply, write it again. I said, Grandpa, if I write 100 letters, if they don't reply, he said, write the 101st first letter, never stop, never give up until they reply. And guess what happened? Magic has started happening. By the age I was 12, I became the friends with the top intellect of the country. By the age of 12, from the authors, from engineers, from um, like the actor, actresses, everybody became my friend at the age of 12. So, and, and also uh, when I was like 10 or 11 years old, my grandfather used to ask me, um, Shabir, what is your main dream? Think about it. I was in a Chittagong in a tiny little city in Bangladesh. And it was literally war-torn country at that time. And I used to say, oh, my dream to have a lunch or dinner with the president of the United States. Think about it. I was in Bangladesh, right? And he said, okay, you can dine with the president of the United States as long as you have the dream, but only with the people who can breathe is still breathing. So the people, American president who already died, you cannot dine with them, but who are alive, you can have a dine with them. But if you have the dream. So I said, grandpa, you really believe that one day I will be dining with American president? He said, absolutely. You mark my word. If you have that belief, you will. And guess what? Like so far, at least I dined with three American presidents so far. And every out of the American president I dined with, I told my grandfather's a story. So the reason I shared this story that I came in this country with nothing, right? And became a global name now, right? So if I can achieve it from nothing, from a humble background, with all the challenges you are facing in Ukraine, each of you can make a difference. With that, it is my honor and great pleasure I wanted to end here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Uh, dear Mr. Chodbury, it was a privilege to have you speaking to us and your uh, lecture was truly inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I think you practically cover covered everything by your lecture. You answered all the questions which we're having uh, here. And uh, the one thing I want to mention is uh, that, uh, in fact, Ukraine was the first to launch the Day of Human Responsibilities, and uh, it captures uh, a yes. lot from yes. what you, you've yes. mentioned. And uh, yes. the um, there is a declaration of the human responsibilities, which can be found or downloaded from the uh, site of the Bogdan Havrolishan Family Foundation. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, our dear participants, uh, we are going to have our next meeting in a week time. Uh, on the 9th of November, we are going to have a lecture by um, Dr. 
uh, Roger Martin, who is a professor emeritus of the Rotman uh, Business School, and uh, he has served as a dean for more than 13 years there. So uh, we are, uh, our lecture will uh, take place at the regular time, 6 p.m. Kiev time or 18 as we have it. And we're looking forward to seeing you and hopefully no power outages will prevent us from what we are doing. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chodborough, once again, it any, was- any, any, of, any of your participants, if they wanted to send me any email with a question, uh, they can send me, you just Google my name, shubhichaudhary.com, and you will find my email and everything there. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, uh, the information, the record of the lecture and its Ukrainian simultaneous translation will be, uh, could be found at our uh, site. The war in Ukraine has changed the world. And now we need to think about where this world is moving to, together. That's why Meme Business School is launching the nationwide educational project Reinforce UA, where the world's greatest minds will share their ideas and insights. And you will get their experience, change your perspective and discover what changes should the business be ready for, before and after the victory. Every week on ReinforceUA.com